Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church uh, of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Thank you for choosing to spend a little time uh, with us viewing our Sunday morning worship experience. And I pray that you will uh, receive something that will prepare you for your future journey. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, teach us to follow Jesus' example of living holy as a way of overcoming prejudice. And then give us a desire to actually follow his example that goes beyond mere religious acts that are mostly for show anyway. But help us to show love and mercy as a way of overcoming prejudices. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our text for this week is found in John chapter 4, verse 1 through 15. Uh, the story goes all the way through verse 48, but I won't read all of those verses. I'll just read the first 15 verses of John chapter 4. And it starts by saying, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he made his pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, and a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you better or greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again. And the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welding up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Now the title of last week's message was Imitating Jesus in Holiness. And this week's message is Holiness Overrides Prejudice. You're familiar with the story of a Jew and a Samaritan woman meeting at Jacob's well. Well, in this season of COVID-19, at first glance, it would appear to be a disease that presents itself as being the, uh, the worst problem that we are facing. But in my opinion, we have a far greater problem that trumps COVID-19 and its prejudice. This more serious disease has been around a long time and it continues from generation to generation. Being prejudiced is not a hereditary disease, but a learned habit. Prejudice is discrimination, racism, injustice, sexism, intolerance, bigotry, unfairness. It's narrow-minded and it brings victims of racial 
prejudice. Prejudice is injury or damage resulting from one's judgment or actions of another in, re in disregard of one's rights, especially that are detriment to one's legal rights and claims. For number one, it's a pre preconceived judgment or opinion. And secondly, it is an adverse opinion or learning formed without just grounds or before sufficient knowledge is gained. Jesus taught his disciples that the kingdom of God is different from the kingdom of this world. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 30, it reads, But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And then, uh, in Mark chapter 9, verse 33, uh, where there was a discussion about who's the greatest. It reads, and they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued about with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And then there's the parable of the wedding feast found in Luke chapter 14, verse 7 through 12. And it reads, now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed that they chose the place of honor, saying to them, in other words, Jesus spoke from his observance of their actions. And I suggest that he sees our actions and knows our thoughts. And he speaks to us today based upon what he knows about us. Verse 8 says, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, or any other feast. Don't sit down in a place of honor. Lest someone more distinguished than you. Be invited by the host. And he who invited you both. Will come and say to you. Give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame. To take the lowest place. But when you are invited and go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be an honored present of all who sit at the table with you. And verse 11 says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humble. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, because the Pharisees were trying to incite uh, competition between Jesus and John the Baptist in John chapter three, verse 25 through 30, Jesus left Judea and started north for Galilee. He could have taken one of three possible routes along the coast or across the Jordan and up through Perea or straight through Samaria. And too often our areas or neighborhoods are a way of casting stigma on one's rights and abilities and worth. Samaria was one of those areas that they were not equal to the Jews. They were said to be not equal with the Jews. And remember, last week we talked about the Good Samaritan that Jesus used to say that he was more holy than the priest and the scribes. It was a preconceived thought that no one good could come out of Nazareth until Jesus made the scene. Orthodox Jews avoided Samaria because there was a long-standing, deep-seated hatred between them and the Samaritans. 
Samaritans were a mixed race, part, of, part Jew and part Gentile. They grew out of the Assyrians' captivity and the ten northern tribes in 727 B.C. They were rejected by the Jews because they could not prove their genealogy. And the Samaritans instead went and established their own temple and religious services. And this only served to fan the fire of prejudicism. And it was so intense that their dislike for the Samaritans that some of the Pharisees prayed that no Samaritan would be raised in the resurrection. In other words, they acted as though they were in control who was accepted and who wasn't by God. When his enemies wanted to call Jesus an insulting name, they called him a Samaritan, as stated in John chapter 8 and verse 48. And because Jesus was on a divinely appointed schedule, it was necessary that he go through Samaria. Here's an example of being on a divine schedule schedule. And if you will work towards a divine schedule, then God will show you how to have the right or choose the right priorities. There was two sisters, Mary and Martha. Jesus was at their house visiting with their brother uh, Lazarus. And it came the scheduled time to serve food, to prepare food and serve it. And Mary got bothered, all upset over much serving that she had scheduled instead of allowing God to schedule her day, that she went to Jesus and asked him, tell my sister to come and help me in the kitchen. Now, Martha was not against serving, but she simply had the right priority at the time and she allowed God to schedule her time, her time at the feet of Jesus. And studying, uh, spending time with the word of God should always take precedence over serving. How are you going to learn how to serve, when to serve, where to serve, if you're not taught? Now, why did Jesus chose this route through Samaria? Maybe it was because he would meet a woman there and lead her into a saving faith. The land of true faith that would affect an entire village. Jesus, we must believe, was not a respecter of persons. Earlier, he had counseled a moral Jewish man in John chapter 3 named Nicodemus. And now he would witness to an immoral Samaritan woman. The disciples went to the nearby town for food while Jesus deliberately waited at the well. He was weary, hungry, and thirsty. And John not only presents Jesus as the Son of God, but also as a true man. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Jesus entered into the normal experiences, and he still does it, to the normal experiences of our lives, and is able to identify with us in each of them. As you read Jesus' conversation with this woman, notice how, he, uh, how her knowledge of Jesus is increased until she acknowledges that he is the Christ. Now, there are three stages in this experience. The first experience, she acknowledges that he's a Jew in verse 7 through 10. In that day, 
it was not considered proper for any man, especially a rabbi, a Jew, to speak in public to a strange woman. As found in John chapter 4, verse 27. But Jesus sets a social custom aside because a soul's eternal salvation was at stake. He chose the right priority. And since the disciples had gone into the city to purchase food, it is obvious that the Jews did have some dealings with the Samaritans. So John was not trying to exaggerate. The phrase can be translated, ask no favors from the Samaritans or use the vessel of a Samaritan. So why would Jesus, a Jew, want to use her polluted vessel to get a drink of water? Of course, Jesus' request was simply a way of opening the conversation to share with her the truth about living water. Whenever Jesus witnessed to people, he did not use sales talk. Jesus adapted to meet every situation, to meet every individual where they were. Jesus would start where the individual was to bring them up to where he was. To Nicodemus, he spoke about uh, being born again. But to this woman, he spoke about living water. And Jesus pointed out that her to her that she was ignorant in three facts. She was ignorant to the fact of who he was, what he had to offer, and how she could receive what he had to offer. And so often the people that we are charged with witnessing to are ignorant of who Jesus is, what he has to offer, and how they can receive it. Here was an eternal God speaking to her, offering her eternal life. And then he was greater than Jacob, as seen in verse 11 through 15. Jesus was speaking about spiritual water, but she interpreted his words to mean literal water. And again, we see how easily people confuse the material with the spiritual. And furthermore, this woman's concern about how he would obtain this water instead of simply asking him, give her a drink of it. Jesus sought to correct her ways of thinking by letting her know that expecting what the world offers, water from the well, would not provide her with true self-worth. But what he had to offer, the living water, would lift her up above the standards that mere men set, the cubes that they seek to place people in. Jesus was offering her something to lift her out of that. But the living water he was offering her her, would provide more than what she needed or ever would need. And then she was ignorant of the fact that he was a prophet, as shown in verse 16 through 24. The way to prepare the soil of the heart for the seed is to plow it with conviction. That was why Jesus told her to go get a husband. He forced her to admit her sin. And there can be no conversion without conviction. There must first be conviction and repentance, and then there can be saving faith. Jesus had aroused her mind and stirred her emotions, but he also had to touch her conviction. And that meant dealing with her sin. I have no husband's was the shortest statement that she had made during the entire conversation with Jesus. Why? Because now she was under conviction and her mouth was stopped, as stated in 
Romans chapter 3, verse 19. But this was the best thing that could have happened to her. And we do well to learn to, 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 to do less speaking and more listening. As James indicated. However, instead of listening to Jesus, she tried to get him on a detour by discussing the difference between the Jews and the Samaritans religion. It is much more comfortable to discuss religion than to face one's sins. But however, Jesus once again revealed her spiritual ignorance. She did not know who to worship, where to worship, or how to worship. And then the third thing that she was not aware of is found in verse 25 through 30, is that he was the Christ. In spite of her ignorance, there was one truth that this woman did know. The Messiah was coming and would reveal the secrets of hearts. We don't know where she learned this truth, but that seed had lain buried in her heart until that very hour. And now it was going to bear fruit. Jesus' response to her statement was literally, I that speak to thee am he. Or I am. For Jesus to say I am is to say that he is all to her and all Samaritans that is needed and ever will be needed. And when Jesus says to us, I am, he's saying I am all that you need and all that you will ever need. And at that point, the woman puts her faith in Jesus Christ and was converted. And immediately she shared her faith with others. So she went into the village and told the men she had met the Christ. And when you consider how little spiritual truth this woman knew, her zeal and witness puts us to shame. But God used her simple testimony. And many of the people came out to the well to meet Jesus. The rabbi had a saying in that age. It is better that the word of the law be burned than delivered to a woman. But Jesus did not agree with that narrow minded prejudice. Gone were the radical barriers and battles that had existed before. They were all on, in one faith and one love. This woman did not come to faith in Christ immediately. But Jesus was patient with her. And in this, we set a, he sets a good example for us in our own personal work of witnessing that we should be patient and bringing people to one faith and one love. We've got to start where they are. And in order to start where they are, you've got to be patient enough to listen to them in order to bring them up to where we are. And where are we? We are at a old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary where Jesus Christ hung, bled, and he died for sinners. They buried him in a borrowed tomb, but early the third day morning, he rose with all power in his hand. Power to forgive. Power to override prejudices. Power to lift up and to bring together instead of to tear down and separate. I choose Jesus' way over the world's way. What about you? 
That's all I have for today, so let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, give us the ability to be thankful for your word and, and to accept that you have the abilities to cause it to come alive in us so that we can move beyond our prejudices. And we can move beyond being hearers only to doers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in closing, I want to remind us to practice wearing our mask, practice social distancing, and practice washing your hands often. And just as the Lord is able to bring us beyond prejudices. He's able to take us beyond this COVID-19 time. And I don't know about you, but I choose to trust him and his way. So until next time, so long. And don't forget that you can view these sermons on YouTube at any given time. All you have to do is in your browser, type in uh, Mount M.T. S.I.N.A.I. of Memphis Incorporated and hit enter and it will take you to our YouTube page. That's M.T. S.I.N.A.I. M.B.C. O.F. M.E.M.P.H.I.S. I.N.C. and hit enter. And you'll find yourself at our YouTube page and you can find all of the sermons, all of the Bible studies that we've been doing and posting since uh, the coronavirus era came into play. And perhaps next month you might run across something or think of something or the Holy Spirit calls something to your remembrance. And you remember something I said in this sermon. You can go back a month earlier and review this sermon at any time. So that's one of the blessings that the Lord is giving us. Take care and we'll see you next time. Bye bye.